Well, once again, uh, thank you so much for coming out to be with us on such an amazing special weekend, 25 years in the life of the church. Uh, if you are new with us, uh, then we up here at Hamilton Mill, we are a little bit over four years old, but as Victory World Church, we are 25 years old, and that was a long time ago. And uh, so we are celebrating that this week, and especially, you know, it just seems like every time you, you flip on the news, look at CNN, pick up a newspaper, it seems like another church leader has fallen, another church church has fallen. It really, it breaks the heart, but that means even more so we need to celebrate what God is doing here at Victory throughout 25 years. And so, yeah. <laughs> So we have, uh, obviously, a lot of things going on uh, this weekend. Ren Collective is here as a special guest, and we also have some other special guests here that we want to welcome. Our our founding pastors, our senior pastors, Dennis and Colleen Rouse, are here, and so they're going to come to the stage, and we're just going to have a conversation today. Let's welcome them to the stage. Awesome. Hey, so like I said, uh, what we want to do today, instead of kind of formally preaching a sermon, we just wanted to have a conversation. You know, obviously, uh, you're not able to get up here all the time because you're down in Norcross and some are not here up here. And so, we, we, you know, obviously, it being such a special weekend, it's such a pleasure to have you guys with us. And uh, thinking back over 25 years, I don't know where you were 25 years ago, uh, but we actually did a little bit of digging. And we found out where some of the staff here was 25 years ago. And so I think we want to put that up here. Let me roll that real quick. I feel really old now. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I think hey, everybody. It, I think it's hard for a lot of people at Hamilton Mill to recognize 25 years since it's really only been a few years since we've been, yeah, up it's been here four years up here at this location. But hey, good to see all of you. <laughs> we love you. We guys. love you guys up here. You are doing an awesome, awesome job up here. Yes. Look awesome. At this. Well, you know, obviously, as we're talking about 25 years here, like you said, a lot of people can't grasp the 25 years. Some people in this room weren't even alive 25 years ago. Um, uh, yeah, two weeks old. Yeah, we had, we had a picture of Bryant, who's our middle school and small groups pastor, uh, as a sonogram, but I think he just <laughs> beat it. And so he, he made it out to be with us 25 years ago. I just feel so old right now. <laughs> Uh, so what we wanted to do, obviously, is just kind of talk with you guys just for a few minutes because, you know, we, if you've been a part of the, the Victory family, you've heard a lot of the stories, you know, that are just kind of sprinkled throughout the sermons, but maybe just to kind of more directly ask a few of these questions. So uh, I, I know we, we want to try and get through a lot, so I'm just going to dive into it. So uh, some of us have heard the story of 25 years ago of you kind of driving out here from Oklahoma, kind of coming back home, driving around the city. Could you tell us a little bit more about 25 years ago, okay? You're driving to Gwinnett County, which has obviously changed in 25 years, and maybe what it was like to start a church from scratch, just the two of you guys, and and coming into a city and trying to start a new vision, all that. What was that like? Well, you know, after we identified the area, and that was just really done through prayer. We were in Bible school, had finished Bible school at the time, and came here on just kind of a fact-finding tour just to find out where are we supposed to land. And as we were driving around, when we crossed under 285, Spaghetti Junction there, the Lord spoke to both of us and said, it's here. We didn't even know where we were. And until at that time, there was a water tower that said, Gwinnett is great. And we said, okay, we're in Gwinnett, whatever that is. (laughs) And of course, Hamilton Mill didn't even exist at that time. But I took back a map 
to Oklahoma of Gwinnett County and just begin to pray. And I put a star on the map, and that star is about five miles from where we are located in Norcross right now. And you know how big Gwinnett County is. My point is that, you know, there was a whole lot of uncertainty about who we were and how we were going to do this. I mean, you would have absolutely been amazed at our worship experience. It was me leading worship on something called an omnicord. And you're like, what is that? It's kind of like the Mr. Microphone of uh, keyboards. Okay. It was almost as dynamic as just what you experience here with Ray. Almost. 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 But, I mean, so God is so merciful. <laughs> and so are the people who came. I think, I think we might have some pictures of some of the first services oh, in yeah. Victory. I think we do. Like on Easter Sunday. Look, at that's, that's me on Easter. Our first in his Easter white Sunday jacket. In my white coat with he is risen we had eight people there on easter that, sunday that was formerly on our bed that was a sheet and <laughs> it, it was big buck program we had just finished know. the omnicord worship it was awesome <laughs> <laughs> well by then we actually had a brave soul who joined me i think we have a picture of that too there yeah there you are there, there you are leading Leslie. the worship double yeah. the worship team Yes. That was our whole worship team. We were singing this tapes at that point. Oh, don't even. And we had, that. okay, so we had, uh, we were, at that time, we were called Victory Christian Center. And uh, we changed our name over the years because there, were, uh, there was another Victory Christian Center here in Atlanta. We did, they kept calling us and saying they're getting all kinds of calls for our church. And so uh, could we please change our name? So we changed it to Victory World Outreach. That was our first sign. That was our first building in, we uh, off of Buford Highway down in Doraville, and that church, we were there in that building for five years. We grew to about 500 people there, 100 people each year from the first year, 100 people, 200, 300 every year. Uh, I was talking with, uh, with Kevin Myers, who pastors 12 Stones, and he and I started almost at the same time. They started about a year earlier than us, and uh, his church was about the same, on the same growth pattern, only a little bit slower, and we both kind of hooked up with John Maxwell in about year number 10 when we were just about... Uh, they were about 600 people. We were about 1,000, and then they just blew by us uh, several <laughs> years ago with their, with their expansion of their campuses and everything. But it's kind of ironic how God's used them in the northern part and us in the southern part. And then we said, you had too much up in the northern. We're going to take some of that <laughs> for ourselves. That's why you're here, Hamilton Mill. Amen. And uh, is that it for the pictures? I think that's it. But... Um so, yeah, so at that point, you know, here's the thing. Uh, obviously, we didn't have any support. Um, no one planted us. And, and in, in some ways, I wouldn't wish that, ex that portion on someone because I think we can do things better as we did here. But at the same time, I, I just want to say this. Even, even through all the uncertainty of how we were going to do this, there was absolutely no uncertainty as to God being with us. And he, he gives you exactly what you need to know to take the next step. And that's what we got used to. So it was a faith ride, but I wouldn't have changed that for the world. You know, uh, I think in this service, there is one person besides Colleen and I that were at, was actually here at the year number 25, at the beginning of our church in our very first Bible study, because I saw him standing out there in the... Uh, in the praise and worship. Steve Siebel, would you stand to your feet? He was here yes. 25 years ago with us in our Bible study. He was just a, a, a teenager. With long, and that's, curly hair. At that point, he's still here with us 25 years later. I just want to recognize him. Awesome. So 1990 to here today. Fantastic. Um, you know, obviously, if, again, if you've been part of the family, you've heard some of these stories about this Acts 1-8 vision, you know, that we kind of pull our, our four parts of our vision from. If you kind of look around the walls here, uh, you, can, you can see the, the four parts of the vision. Uh, if you look around the room, you can kind of see, you know, it's it, reconciling cultures is obviously a big deal for victory. And so um, could you kind of lead us through, because we've heard the end result, the Acts 1-8, okay, there's the vision, but how did, how did we get there? Like, how did, how did you come up with the vision? Were you like reading a book? Did you drive down the street, put a star on the scripture? Or, you know, how, how did we get to Acts 1-8? Well, okay, do we have a picture of the very first vision that we wrote down when we, very, when we begin our church? I think it was in our apartment. I think we have a picture of that. 
uh, where I'm standing there casting vision at the very beginning of our church. Um, I don't know if we've got He's that looking picture. looking through some microfilm. Okay, right it's now. in one of those <laughs> iPad pictures. They'll come up with it in just a minute. But, there it is. Okay, there it is. Okay, that that's was our, the vision. That was our first vision, a shot at writing down the vision. You know, the Bible says when you get a vision, write it down. And, of course, we didn't have computers back in those days. You know, we weren't operating like that back in those days. Everything was handwritten. Come on, somebody. That's just 25 years ago. Isn't that amazing? And so we wrote this down, but we really didn't have the full concept of what we were wanting to do. And about year number two, uh, I was reading a book called The Power of Vision, written by George Barna. Powerful book. And he was sharing with uh, leaders of the body of Christ how important it is for a pastor to have a vision that's very specific and also very unique to what God has called you specifically to do. And so Colleen and I began to pray. We set our hearts to pray about what is the specific vision that you have for victory. And I've always been an Acts guy. I love the book of Acts. It's the great transition book in the Bible. It transitions from uh, the four Gospels into the, uh, the New Covenant with the church, the Gentile church. And it's really where the church took formation and the birthing of the church was in Acts 1 and verse 8 where God says, Jesus said, and these were his last words before he went into heaven. How many of you know it's good to build your life on the words of Jesus? Amen. And so he says in Acts 1, 8, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses of me. And he says four areas, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And when I was reading that, that day, the Lord just spoke to me and he said, this is what I want you to build victory on, on these four pillars. And then he spoke to me out of that scripture. He said, these are the four areas that I want you to represent me in the earth. And he said, Jerusalem for you and for your community is your family. And he said, one of the great weaknesses today in society is the family, the brokenness of family, the divorce, the fatherless children, all the things that are happening in society. And so he said, you, you and your wife have started your family. You're at the perfect age. At that time, we were 32 years of age. You're at the perfect age with a brand new child to then grow in your family understanding and then teach it to the people. So we started really building strong families. That's why we have so much emphasis on marriage classes, raising your children, having great children's ministries and youth ministries at Victory. Then he said Judea, and Judea was our community. And he said, you know, so many churches, they, they're just more like buildings for people to go to instead of lifestyles for people to live. And a lot of people look at the church as a location instead of identifying it as a life in their community. And so we said, we're going to make, be a church that transforms the community. We want to make sure that everybody knows that there is a church here to help meet the needs. And we have just countless outreaches from Victory that have gone on over the last 25 years to the community, both to the poor and the needy, to those who uh, are, are thinking about having abortions, to those who are in the prisons, to nursing homes. As we sit here this morning, there are literally countless members of Victory out ministering right now in nursing homes, in prisons on Sunday morning. They might go to church on Saturday night. And uh, we said we want to make sure that the community knows that we, were, that we are here. And about year number 10 in our church, we were featured in Atlanta Magazine as a, a, a church that really touches the community. And then the third thing, which is probably our calling card, and this is why you look a little different than the average congregation, is he said Samaria. And the Lord said, you remember Samaritans were the arch enemies of the Jew. They were the different race, the different culture. And they always had a, a lot of issues with each other, tensions and history between each other. In, sa in fact, if you go back in history, you can even see some of the the history of slavery between those two groups. And he said that there is a huge tension in the South between blacks and whites going all the way back to the era of slavery. And when Martin Luther King was here uh, in the 60s, I was a young kid and I grew up watching him and learning from him on TV. And I was in the eighth grade and I was forced to segregate, I mean to integrate into the school system. And I was the only white kid in my class in the eighth grade. And for the first time, I got to experience what it was like to be a minority in America. And those of you that are white, those of you that grew up like me in the white communities, most of you don't feel the burden for black America or for Latino America or for Asian America, all the immigrants that are coming. But the Lord was planting a seed in my heart for that and started to show me the value of the kingdom over our earthly culture. 
And, and slowly but surely, he showed me that our earthly culture is what separates us. It's the kingdom culture that joins us together. And sometimes in church, we so idolize our earthly culture that we exalt it above the kingdom. And thus, we become one race only churches. And we only appeal to our own culture out of the way we sing our songs, the way we preach and everything. And so we started casting vision for that right off the bat. And now we have 118 different cultures in one church, the most multicultural church in America. It's amazing. It's an amazing story. And then the fourth thing was, he said, and, and that you would reach the whole world, impact the world. And the Lord spoke to us and he said, I want you to start this year, this was in year number three, to give away at least 20% of all the income that comes into victory that's not designated towards like buildings and things like that into the mission field to reach, to preach the gospel to the world. And to this date, now in 2015, 25 years later, we will have sown over $40 million into the gospel of missions all around the world. Isn't that awesome? You need to give the Lord a praise for that because that, that really lights me up. So that's where our vision came from. It, it happened in about year number two, year number three, and we've just been kind of running from there. Well, obviously, since that time, there haven't been any problems in the church. No. <laughs> um, running a church for, for 25 years, uh, following Jesus for 25 years, leading, you know, two people <laughs> to start a church to five people to a <laughs> hundred people to a thousand to 10,000 plus now. Um, obviously there's going to be at least one problem that happens along the way. So what have been, what have been some of kind of the, maybe the hurdles that you guys have had to, to jump over to actually see a church grow to 25 years? See, again, like I said, when we first got up here, so many, we see so many churches falling. I mean, and that, obviously that hurts us as the church, but how are we still here 25 years later? Well, God is absolutely faithful. And if you stay out of his way, he will do great things. <laughs> I'm serious. That's the thing is, you know, learn how to go with the, the move of the spirit and not to try to be the one that initiates it. I will say that because we have the pillar and the, the big part of our vision to be racially reconciled, that is, you know, no, that is something that we are still working through as, as a nation. I mean, we see this. And so naturally that the difficulties that are on the outside come into the house. And so that's been one of the challenges is that, you know, for people to catch that vision and, and to really um, themselves own it and to, you know, live it outside the church. Because, I mean, I have been in situations where I guess it was about three, four years into the church and I was in, Bu in a store in, off of Buford Highway and it was just me and one salesperson who happened to be a young African-American girl. And... I came up to her to ask her some questions about hairspray or whatever, and she wouldn't even look at me. She just was looking down, and she just kind of gave me a halfway answer. And then someone else came in that was like her, and she was all friendly to them, and it was dawned on me. I thought, I just got dissed. <laughs> and I got offended. And I thought, because I knew the owner, I'm going to let the owner know about what happened here. And the Lord said to me, Colleen, Unless you are willing to give her another experience, how can you expect anything different from her? And can I tell you, that's what we all have to embrace, is we can't base this thing on the necessarily the experiences that we're getting from people. It's about giving them a different experience. And I thought the reason she treated me that way is because growing up, girls that looked just like me had probably hurt her. And so, that's our opportunity when we encounter people of other cultures is to you give them a different experience than they're used to getting and be about giving. And, you know, that's what we're supposed to do. And as we do that, then they are convinced that Jesus is real because they are not getting those experiences elsewhere. I think, uh, yeah, that's awesome. I think that, that probably is our, has been our biggest challenge at Victory. Um, 
when we moved to Gwinnett County, you, you got to understand in 1989, we were here at the end of 1989, Gwinnett County was 90% white. And uh, it had about, even yeah, even southern part of Gwinnett County was predominantly a white county. It was even called a white county. And uh, it's where all the white middle class families were moving. It was one of the fastest growing counties in America. It had been ranked number one for like three or four years in a row. This is before all the people from other countries started immigrating into our country. It was before the expansion of the African American community that started to branch out of the inner city and the urban centers of Atlanta and the, and the south side of Atlanta. And so when we came here, uh, we got to watch up close and personal, and forgive me if I say this because it kind of hits home in Hamilton Mill, what white flight looks like. And white flight meaning that when people of other races start to move into the neighborhood, white people tend to move out. And they move farther out and farther out until they get all the way out to Hamilton Mill. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they recognize they're coming all the way out here. Now we gotta, we gotta go all now the way. Now where are you gonna go? We huh? gotta go to South Carolina if we wanna <laughs> be by ourselves. And, and you got to watch it. You've watched it. You've watched it evolve over the, over the years. Now Gwinnett County is a county, especially in the southern part of Gwinnett County, one of the most multicultural areas in America. All the nations have kind of immigrated to that area in south Gwinnett County, and many of them are, as they, as they grow, they expand out. And so what's happened is I, we, we've seen our church is about 12,000 people in it, what we call active members. They don't, we don't count people that just come and go in the church, but active people that are either giving or serving in the church. And what we've seen is we've had to go through probably close to 200,000 people to get to those 12,000. And the challenges have been, and I think you can relate to this, Johnson, just watching some of our dearest friends leave over time because they just couldn't handle the multicultural environments wanting to go to be just with their one culture and in every in every situation but we just held fast to that we we love people uh, of other races as much as we love our own race and i want to challenge you at victory to do the same you know jesus said the, the mark of a true disciple is how you love one another yeah. and he says when you love one another the way i love you then you're you're really becoming a disciple and you say yeah but those folks of that other culture they're hard to love well, Jesus said, you got to love even your enemies and bless people who curse you and do good to those who hate you and pray for those who use you and persecute you. And I think that's what we want to be an exp expression of as a church because how many of you understand this younger generation, they're, they're a multicultural generation. Yeah. They are marrying each other. They're interacting with each other. They're going to school together. And when they see church described by Martin Luther King, in 1967, as 11 o'clock being the most segregated hour in America, how many of you know that turns them off to church? It turns them off to, why would I want to go to an institution that's all about just being one race only when they're talking about loving people and loving Jesus, and you can't even love outside of your own culture? And so that is a challenge. That's been our probably our biggest challenge, among other things. But, but uh, we're, we've overcome it. We're, come on, we're overcoming this challenge. Yes, we Amen. are. Praise yes, God. we are. Thanks to you. Some of y'all okay hearing that? Uh, some, some, I, I would say 99.999% of people who go to church never hear anything like that. Yeah. And so, y'all okay with that? Yeah. You know, it's something that I grabbed a hold of. Obviously, coming to this church, I was raised, you know, very white Presbyterian boy uh, in, in the sticks of North Carolina. Um, and coming here... Uh, really caught on to Jesus' great prayer, the high priestly prayer uh, there in John, where he says, when uh, you, is the body of Christ, are finally one, that's when the world's going to know that, right. that I'm sent from, sent from the Father. And I think, you know, as, as you quoted Martin Luther King Jr., when we're all segregated out, the world looks at that and says, well, maybe they say the, the blood of Jesus is enough to forgive them, but it's obviously not enough to unite them. And I think that's, that's what I love about this right here when we can look around we got people from you know ukraine we got people from nigeria and australia and then an irish band what in the world is going on irish What's rules going on here? irish rules got a, today like, like from guatemala in the back it's like yeah see it's good it's awesome i love it I wouldn't have it any other way it's so good um y'all know colleen's part irish that's her name colleen is irish that's why when that band started up all of a sudden she felt like she was just in heaven right there yes I, I want to make a request for joy. <laughs> oh, 
would like to hear that, that song. They don't know what that is. That's a song. If they can't do I'm it, I'll come up at the end and I'll do it. I'm talking to Ren Collective right yeah. now, who's probably watching in the green room. Do you hear me? I'll sing it at the end if they can, um, as everyone's gone. Uh, so, obviously, okay, so transitioning uh, to up here. So, started uh, Victory World Church down in that kind of Doraville area, landed in Norcross since 1990. Okay, 2010. All right, is when we officially began up here, August of 2010. So um, maybe if you want to walk us through a little bit of what, kind of what got us to here, and then maybe even looking forward, kind of what's your thoughts about Victor Hamilton Mill now and, and looking into the future? Okay, so uh, some of you that have been here for a while know that this was previously another church many, many years ago. It was a river of life, and then it changed to destiny. And uh, Pastor Philip and Vivian Carter, who were parts of Victory about 10 years ago. They were members of our church. We had become good friends with them. Philip was one of my golfing buddies, and they were looking for a pastor up here, and so we matched them together. They, they, they love Pastor Philip. He came and took over the church, changed the name to Destiny, and was pastor here for over seven years, and when they got ready to make some more transitions, they just, you know, they, he and Tad, whose son-in-law, came to us and said, Will you, uh, would you consider making this a part of the Victory uh, member, you know, part of the Victory body and just absorbing us and then becoming a Victory church? And that's when we did that in latter part of 2009. And uh, we took over. There was just a small building over here. Uh, they had a little bit of land. And then we just took it over. Remember, some of you, how many of you were here during that time? Let me see your hands. You were here during that time. And we moved into a high school. A lot of the people that were still here, they left because they didn't necessarily agree with what we were doing. And, and it was interesting because we just, I remember just sitting before a group of about 200 people and saying, okay, get ready, Victory, because we're going to grow. We're not going to be a church of just 200 people. And, and we want to reach people. But how many of you know, not everybody wants to grow. A lot of people like to stay small, but... Biblically, how many of you know God likes things to grow? Yes. And, and he's not into, you know, just us four and no more. Let's protect our little group. And everybody knows everybody. That We call it family reunion churches. And nothing wrong with them except they're not reaching people for Jesus. And there is a lot. How many of you know there's a lost and dying community out here yeah. that yeah. desperately needs Jesus? There was no traffic jam to get up on the roads here to come to church uh, this Sunday morning. And so... Uh, that's kind of how we did it. We took on the church, and then uh, Johnson and Summer, who were our fusion pastors at that time, uh, came to us and said, hey, would you consider us, uh, for the, when you start thinking about the next um, church plant, we had planted some churches, and so they, they just became a natural. They love this area. They have a heart. They had such a heart for the suburbs because they recognized that where we are, you know, in, in our Norcross location is a little bit more urban, a little bit more connected to the city. And that's a whole different um, a flavor and almost different culture than it is out here and in Hamilton Mill. And they had such a heart to introduce what we were doing there up into this area, in, into the suburbs. And so that's kind of how that all came about. And they've just done an awesome, don't y'all love your yes, pastors? They have. They've just done an awesome job. So I, I don't know if you have anything on your heart right now, but kind of looking forward into the future of Hamilton Mill here. You know, maybe look a year down the road, five years down the road. What, what do you kind of see for happening up here in this area, maybe that this church would look like or be involved in? Well, you know, this building was designed to be able to then spread out this way. So when we built this addition, we already have planned for this to double. Are you guys okay with that? <laughs> Because uh, we see this as a growing area, and we want to be a part of reaching this community. And it's really important to us to always be where the Spirit of the Lord is, and to bring the gospel, to bring the light, and to, to really be a part, like he said earlier, our intention is never to just be a location, it, it, to be found. But we intend to be a living body who go and who impact the neighbors and who really are, you know, our goal is to become, we, we say about victory that we are becoming fully committed disciples of Jesus Christ because it is a process. We are working out our salvation with fear and trembling. And so 
in keeping with that, there is plans for expansion. I don't know that, you know, God would want to do some other things, like maybe a school out here. You know, they, who knows? We are dreaming, okay? We are dreaming, and we are receiving the download from the Lord, but this area is vitally important. Can I say you aren't just another location of victory? You are j the heart of this house. We have one heart together, and you are just as important as what's going on in Norcross to us. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. So just kind of wrap this up so that we can, because uh, I know we have to get out of here and of the next service, but just thinking ahead, and as Colleen said, we can expand this building to twice the size of what we currently have, but how many of you know we can't do that unless you pay for it? <laughs> and as, as, as people have said before, the, the good news is the money is in the house. We have the money to pay for it. The bad news is it's in your pockets, <laughs> and we need you to get it out of your pockets and give and s supply. No, it, all, all kidding aside, just understand that the vision of victory is very big. It's, it's an expansive vision. It's not just for Hamilton Mill. It's not just for Norcross. We plan on planting a church in Buckhead, eventually one in Stone Mountain. We have, church, we have six church plants around the city that have already planted out of victory that are all thriving and doing well. But our goal is to reach the whole city with the gospel. Everything is limited by how well we do financially in the church because we can only do so much with buildings and things of that nature if we don't have the resources. And so we're trying to do our best to, to steward our resources, to make sure that we're not taking on debt that we can't handle and things of that nature. And this campus is very important. It's vital to the whole body because how you do with your giving determines what can happen sometimes in other parts of the city whether we can plant new churches in the other parts of the city, whether we can do more things on the mission field. And our goal is we're 57 years old. You know, we've been here since we were 32. And so, you know, we're not getting any younger. And eventually, we'll, you know, there'll be other people that'll take over victory in years to come. And so we have probably a good few, we still have a few years left. We're not ready to go off to pasture yet. But, uh, but, we, but we figure in our remaining years, we need to make sure that we pay off our buildings, yeah. amen, that we get all of our buildings paid off, that we get all of our debts paid off, that we make sure that we continue to give at the level we've been giving to missions and, and to support what we're doing. And our, our motto, and, and, and Johnson's going to preach on this probably next weekend, is simplicity, sincerity, and sacrifice. Let's say that together. Simplicity, sincerity, and sacrifice. And we, what we believe in is living a simple life, simplifying our life. We still live in the same home we bought in 1999. We're not expanding our lifestyle. We're not trying to build a big house or kingdom to ourselves. And, and we try to live, all of us try to live a simple life in, in such a way so that we can uh, make sure that we're not being misunderstood as, as pastors or leaders of the church. And then sincerity, and this is kind of the foundation of in fact, the first two years of our church, we focused on that one theme of just building character in the foundation of the people. Because if without character, how many of you understand, you can build a foundation that's not built on character, it's built on hype and excitement and motivation, but if you don't have character, eventually your, your life will fall when you get attacked. If, if you're not building it on the rock, if you're building it on sand. So we believe in character, making sure that we're living right before the Lord. And then the third thing, was sacrifice, asking ourselves this question, which a lot of Americans are really not asking themselves, particularly those who live out here in the suburbs, what can I give up for someone else? What can I give up, you know, my Starbucks every day or five times a day or my, my, the, having the newest iPhone or whatever it is that we're always consumed with in the American culture, this consuming culture, what could we live in such a way that we could give up a few things in order to sacrifice for other people? And once you get the picture, and I want to challenge you this year, because we believe in missions, we want to take, we take teams over all over the world, all over the world to expose people to the third world. Once you've been exposed to the third world, your problems are not so big. You come home and you don't see things through the lens of the American culture anymore. You see it through the biblical lens of the world. And once you see things through the biblical lens of the world, you begin to see, I'm a little bit spoiled here in America, and I'm living in such a way that maybe is not very sacrificial. And so as we go forward, we're asking everybody at Victory to be simple in their lifestyle, 
sincere in their character, and sacrificial in their giving. And when you do that, how many of you know God will do the rest? He'll bless the church and he'll do the rest. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what we're going to do, Ren's, uh, Ren's going to come back out and close us out. But before uh, we do that, would you mind, just as a senior pastor, would you mind close us, closing us in prayer and maybe just kind of leading us uh, in a prayer together as Let's well? take a moment and just bow our heads before the Lord. And now we've kind of heard the, the vision. We've kind of heard of what God is doing and what he's starting to do in our lives. And so I want you to just take a moment and I want you to think about where you stand in all this. Where are you? Are you committed to the church? Are you committed to the things that God has called you to? Maybe you're here this morning, and maybe your life is not where it needs to be with Jesus. And I just want to encourage you. God gives us moments in our life from time to time to just make a full surrender to Jesus Christ. And that's why maybe you're here this morning, to make that full surrender. So I want to encourage you just to take a moment, and if you're here today and you say, I need to get my life right with God, before I leave today, I need to surrender to Jesus. I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out of the crowd. I'm going to pray with you right where you are. But if that's you, I want you to just simply slip up your hand and say, I need Jesus this morning. I need to surrender to Christ or I need to come back to Christ all over this building. Thank you, thank you, thank you, all over. Thank you, guys. I'm going to lead us in a prayer before we have Wren Collective come back. And if you mean that from your heart, I want you to pray with me. And believers, if you'll just join with me, let's say this together. Jesus, right now, I repent of my sins, I turn away from the darkness, and I turn to you, Jesus. I accept that you are the Lord and you are the master. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. And I ask you, Jesus Christ, to come into my heart, deliver me from all darkness, and replace it with light. Today, I surrender my life to Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Let's give God praise for all those who are giving their hearts.